right now we're, <clears throat> we're going from one controversial bill to another, um, which is H-145. Um, and I'm pleased that uh, several folks who were invited to join us this morning have, have done so. <clears throat> I think a basic issue for this committee right now is the change um, that allows in certain situations the, choke, the use of the choke. Uh, we did not hear from, I think our first witness is Dr. Eaton. Eaton, eight. I'm sorry, Dr. Uh, Aton, it's I know that. The rest of it I stumble with. Um, and I hope you will excuse my effort. Um, Aton, thank you for joining us this morning. Really Absolutely, it. Senator. Um, thank you. And uh, Dr. Nazrin Longo is the chair of the uh, Racial Disparities uh, in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System. Our dad. As well Good as. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning to you as well. Shall I start then? Yeah, please do. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think this can be fairly brief, and I know that that would be preferable given what you have um, on your schedules today. The RDAP has largely concentrated upon later moments in the criminal and juvenile justice systems moments um, quite soon after an application of use of force would generally for us be an issue, but we have not in particular looked at these very early moments of engagement. Um, after initial engagement with the um, criminal and juvenile justice system has in general been our purview as that 2019 report makes clear the enabling statute asks the panel to consider firstly, how to institute a public complaint process to address perceived implicit bias across all systems of state government. Secondly, whether and how to prohibit racial profiling. And three, whether to expand law enforcement race data collection practices um, to include data on non-traffic stops by law enforcement. We did go further, obviously, you've seen that report. Um, and we got much broader than that um, and looked at other moments of engagement with the criminal and juvenile justice systems. A quote from that report, the panel recommends developing laws and rules that will require data collection that captures high impact, high discretion decision points that occur during the judicial processes within, and there's a whole list there, as well as the administrative processes within DCF and the Department of Corrections, unquote. Arguably, a moment of force is the highest impact and highest discretion moment imaginable, but I'd submit that our enabling statute did not in spirit direct us in that direction. So we don't have a lot to offer at the moment. Nevertheless, at our meeting roughly 36 hours ago, some thoughts were shared. Um, these do not, it is important for you to know, necessarily represent consensus as conditions have not and did not allow us that level of discussion or formality. Um, several people you've heard from already because of course the RDAP consists of governmental actors as well as community members. You've heard, I believe, from Judge Grierson, who is our representative from the judiciary, and he cannot comment upon policy. David Scher, who I know you know, um, reports, of course, that the AGO supports the bill. Sheila Linton is a community member who is on the RDAP, and she is of the Root Social Justice Center down here in Wyndham County, and she had a good deal of commentary. Um, she felt that it was very triggering, as do I, for a Black person to listen to the bill in the current environment, given that extrajudicial killings of Black people are still very much in evidence, as the shooting over the weekend of Dante Wright in Minnesota makes clear. There's a lot of painful information in this bill, as is evident. It speaks of when one can harm and kill. 
Ms. Linton's points were in some wise made from the 10,000 foot level, which is in fact the level from which the RDAP's initial report submitted on the 4th of December of 2019 were made. She feels that we are in totality still operating under white supremacist culture. And she questions the act of operating within that framework as H145 does and critiquing a use of force bill while being in that framework. Ms. Linton's comments are rooted in a deep awareness of the widely perceived bias of the law against the concerns of people of color. And she feels that there are policies on the books that H145 does nothing to question. Yet, this is a bill that helps refine the already extant permission given for use of force in a culture that largely works against people of color. This makes her uneasy to say the least. Other concerns had to do with policy implementation. And we are as a panel aware that the Department of Public Safety is currently writing that policy. Ms. Linton was further concerned with the process for unlearning policies that are currently in place. Of course, this always happens, but as a community member deeply invested in advocacy, she wanted to know what unlearning policy looked like. Clearly, there are questions on the panel concerning the policy and its implementation. Again, Ms. Linton is very concerned and brings up often on the panel and is in some ways the panel's conscience on this, the issue of accountability. After implementation, who holds people accountable? Who does this? How does a process of accountability work? She was quite pleased to hear about mental illness accommodations. Um, I won't speak to great length on that because I know that Wilda White is here this morning. Um, she was also pleased uh, that there's no bystander status allowed for cops who witnessed wrongdoing on the part of their colleagues. An issue that has come up uh, at other moments on the panel that um, certainly has come up culturally for uh, many people since 1989 is the definition of reasonable and reasonableness. Yes, people are aware that this was defined by the Rehnquist Supreme Court in Graham versus Connor, but some folks on the panel who are people of color are not settled about this. The idea of definitions is very much present here and something that needs to be asked. Again, this seems to be a vestige of white supremacist culture. Um, the objectivity seen by the Supreme Court in the term reasonable is not perceived by many people of color and has not been since Graham versus Connor was argued in 1989. In short, to be blunt, what a white person sees as reasonable and what a person of color sees as reasonable are not necessarily the same thing, have not necessarily been the same thing. Just because the Rehnquist court did not recognize the potential differences in definition does not speak to a perceived truth, certainly not for people of color. We are pleased on the panel to have a lot of members who are actually not on the panel officially come and speak with us and work with us. One of those would be Representative Martin Lalonde. He um, informed us certainly that DPS is forming policy on training as regards H145. And he opined that perhaps the RDAP should weigh in on the policy. As chair of the panel, I can say with a fair amount of certainty that that would likely be a welcome gesture and certainly so to the community members of the RDAP who have not had a very great voice in this. Um, lastly, I'd like to note Rebecca Turner's comments. You know her, she's an appellate defender from the office of the Defender General. Um, her office supports, I believe, H145 in general, but not in totality. She echoed Sheila Linton's concern. Um, she also was concerned about the interpretation of terms that are used. Um, again, the creation of a new crime is, as she points out, a problem in general for the Defender General. Um, 
She also said that she thinks that the law is perhaps too narrowly focused. It doesn't look at a system, but rather as bad, at bad actors within that system. There was some question about police disciplinary records as well. Are they public? Are they not? Um, there's a sense that they need to be. Um, she was pleased again about mental health protections, but didn't feel that there was enough here. Um, and that is something that, of course, the RDAP covered in far greater uh, depth in its report of 2019 and will take up again as it seeks to deepen the work that it did on that initial report. And that's all I have to tell you this morning. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, couple of questions. Did anyone focus on the rewrite of the... Um, <clears throat> sections regarding, um, now I lost it, um, section four, justifiable homicide. <clears throat> uh, the committee was somewhat concerned about when um, using the terms burglary or robbery. Was there any discussion? If not, that's fine. Um, but we we kind of looked at that and, and uh, I mean, everybody kind of understands um, suppression of somebody to commit murder, sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, but robbery can mean a lot of things. Um, yeah, oh, you're, you, I'm sorry, you said the committee and I think you're the committee and yeah, I'm on the-, the I'm sorry, the Judiciary <laughs> Committee and you're, yeah. Did anyone on your committee uh, look at section four and have any comments? If not, not that, I mean, that's fine. Yeah. The, this committee, Senate Judiciary, is a little concerned about the use of the term burglary or robbery, which would allow the use of justifiable use of deadly force on the part of any citizen. We did not get, we just did, we didn't get into that level of part of what I guess it. concerns us, and it's awful that I've forgotten the man's name who was short, shot in Georgia going into a vacant building, presumably to mm -hmm. get water and shot from being in the neighborhood by a man and his son. Right. The, that incident uh, <clears throat> triggers this, you know, he, he wasn't mm -hmm. robbing anyone as that, you know, he was in a vacant building. Right. If he was, he was in a vacant even building. if he was taking something out of the building, you know. Why would he be shot? <laughs> yeah, why sh which should he be shot for? Something like that. Yeah, no, we did not, again, get that specific. Okay, Senator White. Thanks. Uh, so, Eitan, I just wanted to uh, say that some of the issues that you brought up, both from Sheila and from Rebecca, are, um, they're not, while they're not in this bill, they are being addressed by the council, not by the department, but by the newly constituted council. And we now have the council is made up of um, a majority of non-law enforcement. And, and so a number of those issues are being addressed by the, by the council, but aren't specifically part of this bill. And I will take that back to the panel. Thank you, Senator. And I can give you um, the details on what they're doing because we're listening to this in law for in government operations now because we cover law enforcement. So I give you details. Yep. Thank Are there you. Any further questions for the doctor. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really Absolutely. It. Always well. helpful. You too. Always helpful. Uh, Wilda White is our next witness, um, and. I've got to step away for about five minutes, um, and I'll be back, and uh, I'll be able. To. One good thing about YouTube is I can review what I missed. Uh, good morning, uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. My name is Wilda White, and I am currently the founder of an organization called Mad Freedom. Um, which is a 
national civil rights and human rights organization whose mission is to secure political power in order to end the oppression and discrimination against people based on their perceived mental states. I'm also an attorney, um, not licensed in Vermont, but licensed in California, New York, and Massachusetts. I'm the former, uh, actually the inaugural executive director of the Center for Social Justice at UC Berkeley School of Law, my alma mater. Um, and I'm also was the inaugural chair of the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission here in Vermont, where we investigated the um, law enforcement killing of uh, Phil Grennan in his in his home. Um, and finally, I was the former I'm a former executive director of Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, and I do consider myself a uh, psychiatric survivor. Um, and I bring all of that to bear on my testimony uh, here today. Um, and, and particularly, I, you know, I, while, <laughs> while, you know, being, being black is not uh, forefront in my identity. Um, it is uh, how I am identified by this society. Um, and I've had certain experiences based on that. And I, that also influences my testimony here on this bill today. Um, overall, I, uh, Mad Freedom supports um, H-145 as it left the House Judiciary Committee. Um, we think that it represents a very good compromise. Um, and, you know, oftentimes I think since last summer when uh, the House, when the, when the uh, General Assembly adopted uh, the use of force bill, what I found myself doing in the uh, intervening year is every time I hear of a, uh, a police killing or attempted police killing, I, also, I always go back and apply and say, what would have happened in Vermont? Well, is that illegal in Vermont? What would this use of force bill have done in Vermont? And so often I feel like this use of force, the, the, the action that happened in some other state, if it had happened in Vermont, it would have been an unlawful use of force. And it makes me really um, uh, happy to have seen that bill passed uh, here in Vermont. Um, and so I do feel like if it is heeded by law enforcement, uh, H-145 um, is a, a really good bill and really can save lives and restore confidence in law enforcement. Uh, I think this one for H-145 is an improvement upon what was passed in the last legislative session because it um, gets rid of this uh, prohibited restraint uh, word um, because it really wasn't a prohibited restraint because it was because the law does allow law enforcement officers to use it um, if their lives are uh, in jeopardy. Um, and it also really clarified the definition um, of a prohibited restraint. It, it both renamed it a chokehold and it clarified the definition so that uh, in a prosecution, you, didn't, you wouldn't have the same kinds of proof problems you would have had on the earlier definition. Um, so I, I do think it's a much improved bill and we do support it. I am concerned, however, about um, the Department of Public Safety um, wishing to insert the words to the extent feasible uh, in uh, subsection B5. Uh, Mad Freedom worked very, very hard to include this language in the bill. Um, because, um, you know, there's research to suggest that the people who are at the highest risk of being killed by police officers are people who are, at the time, uh, uh, experiencing a mental impairment. Um, and these are people who are often killed in and around their homes. Um, the police have been brought to their homes because a loved one is called and said, hey, my, uh, my loved one has a, uh, a mental illness. Uh, or and um, they're acting in a certain way because of that mental illness and we need some help. And because our society doesn't have a lot of resources for responding to this, the police are sent to respond. And in the course of responding to this person who has committed no crime, um, the person often ends up dead. Um, and so uh, Mad Freedom worked very hard to include this provision in the bill because it tracks current language um, that has been uh, adopted by the Second Circuit um, about how police should respond to people who have, uh, who are in a mental health crisis. And um, 
I mean, and I, and I want to take the time to read to you what the court says so you can see how closely uh, this language tracks. Um, a direct quote from, uh, from the Second Circuit, which is the federal court that covers Vermont. Um, so in, the, in, the mo in a recent case called Chamberlain versus City of White Plains, the Second Circuit of Court of Appeals adopted the rule that the use of force against an individual whom the officer knows or reasonably should know is suffering from a mental illness should not be evaluated in the same way as the use of force to apprehend a person suspected of a serious criminal wrongdoing. And they quoted cases um, that explained, and I'm quoting here, the level of force that is constitutionally permissible in dealing with a mentally ill person differs both in degree and in kind from the use of force that would be justified against a person who has committed a crime or who poses a threat to the community. Consequently, a subject's mental illness is a factor that a police officer must take into account in determining what degree of force, if any, is appropriate. So this very much tracks um, that B5, very much tracks all of that constitutional jurisprudence. Um, in fact, it's actually more restrictive uh, and more limited than the constitutional jurisprudence because it only applies when you know the person has a mental illness, you know the conduct that is problematic is caused by that mental illness. You don't have to make any assessment, you just know it. Um, and the only thing you have to do is take it into account, which means simply you consider it along with other factors. That's all you have to do. Um, and it's the position of Matt Freedom that even this really minimal um, requirement on the law, a part of law enforcement would save many lives. For example, Phil Grennan, um, who was killed by Burlington Police Department when he was in his apartment, they knew that he had a mental illness. They could have known that he, um, because of his mental illness, he was in a psychotic state. And he had said that if the police come to my apartment, I am going to, I believe they're coming to kill me and I am going to use knives in self-defense. All we're saying in a, in a case where you know that the person is, has a mental illness, he's psychotic, he believes that you're coming to kill him and he's going to act in self-defense, that you consider that before you storm into the apartment. That's all we're asking, that you consider it. That's all the law requires. Now, I know you heard an example from Julio Thompson, who said that this was an unreasonable, that you needed the word feasible, because what happens if the police officer knows someone has a mental illness, knocks on the door and the, and, and the opening and the person kills them. Now, this example is not implicated by this language, because first of all, the officer has to know they have a mental illness, but also that the conduct is caused by the mental illness. In the example that Julio Thompson gave you, the officer had no idea what the conduct was. It was a split second, he opened the door and the conduct happened. And so this, the officer would not be asked, did you consider um, whether the person had a mental illness? Because that's not the only question. You have to know both that they have a mental illness and the conduct that is problematic is caused by that. And it doesn't require you to diagnose it's information that, you, that had been supplied before arriving. Um, so so, so um, I, I really urge the, the, the committee to um, resist the temptation to dilute B5, which is already, um, I think what, as Senator Baruth um, really astutely observed, doesn't require very much at all. Um, but we feel that it requires just enough to save the lives of people like um, of Phil Brennan. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I will say that um, one of the things that uh, was troubling about this bill was that it um, you know, affirmatively states on its face that the chokehold is permissible um, in um, when, when the officer's life is in, in jeopardy. And while uh, I feel like a police officer should be able to use any means necessary to, to save 
um, their lives when their lives are um, in jeopardy. It is problematic seeing uh, the law so explicitly state that you can use a, a, a chokehold, um, particularly when we're saying we're not going to teach a chokehold. And in the, in, 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 in the Judiciary Committee, I, I suggested that um, even understanding that a chokehold is permissible, I probably would have, I probably would prefer not to see it so plainly stated that it was that you could use it, but let the work be done by the justifiable homicide statutes. For example, if you felt like you had to use it, that defense would still be available regardless of whether um, the statute explicitly stated that you could use it. Um, but in the spirit of compromise, we still support the bill, uh, particularly because um, we felt like it was really more important to have B5 survive intact than to um, argue so forcefully against removing the chokehold thing. So H145 is very much a compromise bill. Um, and given that, I, I still think it, it's, it's a, a good bill. Um, it's good for Vermont. It makes me feel safer in this state. Um, it makes the people uh, who are my constituents um, feel like uh, you know, if they, they call the police about a loved one, there's a chance that their loved one won't be shot. Um, and I heartily urge you to um, pass H145 as it came to you, unamended um, in, in its current form. And I'm available for questions if there are any. You're muted, Dick. That'll be one thing. I mean, even if we do Zoom um, when we get back to normal. We won't have to mute ourselves. <laughs> Even if you monitor through YouTube, you wouldn't have to mute. Um, I guess my question, uh, both you, you, you've really answered my concern um, about B5, the idea that the office, it's only when the officer knows. So that is the clarifying language. Am I hearing you correctly? Yes. Knows two things. Knows the yeah. mental illness and knows that the conduct <clears throat> is caused by the mental illness. Because remember, not everything a person with a mental illness is do it does um, is because they have a mental illness. And I say that as a person who has been diagnosed with a severe mental illness, who suffered a protracted period of psychosis. Um, and not everything I did was because I was psychotic. Um, regarding the, the chokehold, um, some of us have believed that um, if we don't do H-145, then the current law takes, takes effect. Um, and what I heard you saying was that, that it's important to move forward um, with 145 rather than like having the current law take effect on July 1, the bill we passed last year. Yeah, H-145 is a better bill than the bill you passed uh, last year, particularly because of the clarification around chokehold. Uh, getting rid of the term prohibited restraint is a, a very much a step forward. I explained in House Judiciary that, um, you know, as a former trial lawyer, um, juries get really hung up on words. And if you were to go to a jury um, and say, this officer used a prohibited restraint, um, to save his life, is he, you know, not guilty under justifiable homicide? I've talked to so many jurors, and they would say, "Well, of course he can't use a prohibited restraint; it's prohibited." Um, you know, and so that's why I encourage the um, judiciary committee to get rid of that prohibited restraint because it would not, you know, it, it would confuse certain jurors who are literalists. So I think using the word chokehold is much better. The other thing about the existing bill that will come into effect if H-145 is not passed is that the way it defines prohibited restraint, it's like you put your hand here, you put your hand here, your hands here, you cut off this. That creates major proof problems for a prosecutor. It's like, well, where, was, where exactly was his hand and did, was oxygen stopped? Was blood flow stopped? You, know, you would have to call in expert witnesses who would just be surmising. This is a very clear explanation. It's a greatly improved definition of a, of a chokehold. Um, and it, and it, it borrows some of the language from the, the, the uh, bill that was uh, passed at the end of December, 2020 in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. 
Um, and so while it's not identical, um, it's, it's, it's as artfully drafted as that Commonwealth of Massachusetts statute. So yes, I, and I think law enforcement, when you heard from um, Commissioner Schilling, if that's his title, uh, I believe he said that he felt like this was much improved and he, and he uh, fully supported it um, over what was passed in the last legislative session. Thank you. Other questions, Senator Benning. Good morning, Wilda. I'd like to go back to B5 for a moment and talk about eliminating the feasible language phrase. Um, using your scenario of somebody going to the home of somebody who is in a mental situation uh, that's problematic, if dispatch informs the officer on the way that dispatch has learned that the individual has said, if a police officer comes to the door, um, they're coming to kill me and I'm going to react accordingly. The police officer goes to the door, knocks on the door, announces so-and-so law enforcement agency, open the door or whatever. If that word feasible is not there and the door is opened by somebody who is thrusting a knife in the direction of the officer, is the jury deprived of something in that flow of deliberation about what the officer's actions um, should have been? Well, I, I do not believe so, Senator Benny. Thank you for the question. Because, you know, the, the question is not, um, in that case, uh, the, let me say what the question is. The question is, officer, you heard from the dispatcher that the person has a mental illness because of uh, that illness, believe that the police were coming to their apartment to kill them uh, and, and they would act in self-defense with knives. Um, and the question would be to the officer, did you take that information into account before you approach the door? And if the answer is in the affirmative, the officer has met the requirements of the statute. And you may want to ask the officer, well, what did you do to take it into account? You know, hey, I considered it but I also believe that there might be someone in the apartment who a person was going to harm. And so I didn't think it was, um, I didn't have the time to call in other resources that I might've called in if we didn't think there was someone else in the apartment who might've been in danger. If we knew that the, you know, if you know that the person's alone in the apartment, not harming anybody, then yeah, you would call in other resources. You would use, um, many, I know Burlington has a really good policy on how to handle people who are in mental distress. Unfortunately, they haven't followed it. But if they did, you know, that policy requires them to slow down, use time. Um, do not crowd the person, right? Give the person space. Set up a command center away from, uh, so out of sight and out of hearing. Um, use communication, bring in a, um, you know, a hostage negotiator uh, or whatever the 21st century term for a hostage negotiator is. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's, so that's, and that's all we're saying is like, we want, we, we, what we want law enforcement to do, what, what we want B5 to do is to, to have law enforcement officers take it into consideration. Uh, and when time allows, Implement your policies, implement your policy, you know, follow, use time to your advantage, get resources that would help you. Um, <clears throat> and that's it. So I, I, I hope, Senator Benning, that I, uh, I've answered your question. Yeah, you actually have, and I appreciate that response. Um, one of the, the handicaps, I guess, of being in a very rural part of the state is that we don't have the resources that you just mentioned. Uh, but if I understand you correctly, what you're really looking to have happen is the officer approaching the door to begin with um, should be making decisions about whether it is necessary to bang on the door in the first place. Yes. And I understand and appreciate that. Thank you very much. Dick, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Wilda, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Actually, 
um, you've been extremely helpful and uh, for me anyway, in terms of the, uh, the if feasible language in B5 uh, is recommended uh, to us. I also, um, You, you asked about the justifiable homicide statute. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, that language has been in the Vermont's justifiable homicide statute for a long, long, long I time. Um, and I think the, those those um, justifiable homicide statutes, you know, uh, are, are similar in many, many states, um, arising kind of from the common law definitions of burglary and robbery. Um, and you know, robbery always, the definition of the common law definition of robbery involves, um, you know, threat of force or use of force. And so it's, you know, it was understood that, you know, if somebody is robbing you because by definition, it, it means they're using some kind of force that you yeah. are allowed to uh, respond in kind. Um, and, and, and burglary um, by definition is just breaking into uh, a place with the intent to, to commit a crime. We usually think that burglary just involves theft, but no, it's by the common law definition, it means the intent to commit any crime. Um, and you know, I'm kind of intimately familiar with this because one, one, one night in San Francisco, I was asleep and I was awakened by a man in my apartment who was naked. Um, and um, you know, we managed to get him, scare him away, but the, the, and the police came and they took it so seriously, uh, much more seriously than I thought they would because they said people who break into your home when they know you're there are extremely dangerous people. Um, and so I think that is the mindset behind including in the justifiable homicide statute, um, the crimes of burglary and robbery. Now I say that not saying that I support it or not support it. I'm just trying to give you uh, well, a sense of why yeah. those might be there. For myself, I'd feel a lot more comfortable that it was at least burglary into an occupied dwelling. Using the example of the, the man in Georgia who walked into a construction site, a building that was under construction. Presumably getting some water. I guess there was water available there and was out jogging or walking. I can't remember. Apparently he was just, apparently he wasn't even getting water. And it, it would be interesting whether that would even be considered a dwelling. I mean, it was something that was under, I think the right. most, I don't think he was, that, I don't think he could have made, he definitely could, you could not have charged him with burglary. He had no intent to commit a crime. Um, he didn't enter with the intent to commit a crime. I think he entered out of curiosity. I think you know, but many people what, are whatever his intent was, it, it was not an occupied dwelling. And I think that using the term occupied dwelling would help these situations. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that's a policy where, decision up to you. Where you uh, yeah, when you were in San Francisco. Um, any other questions? Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity um, to testify. A number of folks are here on the, um, the Zoom. Uh, Feed. If you'd like to comment now as we start to mark up the bill, um, you're welcome to do so based on any of the conversation we've had so far. If not, uh, I'll begin. Um, I'll begin at the end at, at section four, since I just asked a question about it. Would the committee feel more comfortable if the term in section four two were burglary into an occupied dwelling? Yes. No. Senator Nick, no. I mean, you could be in your garden shed working and someone doesn't know you're there. They break in and then you in turn harm them. I'm not saying you kill them, but say you harm them because they've suddenly been in your private space and uh, you turn around and harm them. You know, you, you could I be. Think, uh, I think in your private shed or wherever it would be. If if you're in there, then I think it is a dwelling. Um, How about your garage? Well, I mean, you can, uh, maybe we should ask Bryn. Yeah, um, I think we should ask Bryn. 
So the definition of an occupied dwelling, um, it's actually in statute. It's at 1201B2. Um, so if you'll just give me a moment, moment, I'll read that for you. So occupied dwelling means a building used as a residence, either full-time or part-time, regardless of whether someone is actually present in the building at the time. Um, so I think because it's defined as a residence, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that a shed would count. Um, it, it may be worth hearing from prosecutors whether a shed that's on your property would count, um, if it's on your residential property, whether that would count or not. Okay. But I suspect that it would not, since I don't think it would. It could be defined as a residence. Okay. So, if if this has been on the books for a long time and it hasn't been caused an issue, is there a need to change it? I guess is my question. Well, well the courts would rule on whether or not it was justifiable homicide, mm -hmm. but. I'm thinking of that there's no reason to believe a similar um, set of circumstances wouldn't occur a man in Georgia. Maybe they'd have to prove he wasn't burglarizing. I don't know the outcome of the Georgia law. This is when you can use justifiable to kill somebody. Or wound. Well, Title is just, yeah, uh, title is justifiable homicide. All right, well, let's, uh, I personally think there should be some kind of a modifier on the term verbal. Um, robbery's been explained, and I think that one, uh, <clears throat> we could hear some testimony on that next week. Um, Going back to um, B5, Wilda um, just went through with us. Uh, Julio Thompson and um, Mike Sherling, our Commissioner Sherling, asked us to consider language if feasible. I personally. So I, I have a question, Dick. Um, when when we're talking about that, I remember Commissioner Sherling wanted to add to the House passed bill the phrase, it, uh, if feasible or when feasible. But then in this House passed draft on page five, um, subsection five, it says when feasible. So are we talking about the request to add when feasible, or are we talking about eliminating that clause that's already in uh, You're looking at, I believe the bill is introduced, and I'm looking at the bill as passed by the House. No, I've got it as passed by House. Mine says in B5, when a law enforcement officer knows the subject conduct is a result of medical condition or mental impairment. Yeah. That's right. I was, I, I'm sorry, I was looking on page five, and it already says when feasible, but that's a different issue, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Where where's the line with the other one that it want that um, page headed to? Page I'm three. On page three. Um, I don't have a line, but it's B five. It starts when an law enforcement officer knows that a subject conduct is a result of a medical condition, mental impairment, development disability, physical limitation language barrier, drug or alcohol impairment or other factor beyond the subject control, the officers will take that information into account in determining the amount of force appropriate to use on the subject, if any. Yeah, I, uh, if I can, I just will quickly say again, I, I just don't think that this is asking a lot of the law enforcement officer so we're all agreed that they know about this mental condition. I can't imagine a circumstance where a person would say, I knew about it, but I didn't take it into account. 
I think any officer that is told about that would say, I took it into account, but other factors were loomed larger in my decision-making like the knife. So, so it's really, it's really just stating something that's really I'm kind, of, I'm kind of smiling because, you know, it, it includes if somebody's impaired, um, drunk or yeah. impaired by drugs. And it was a recent issue down here in Bennington County. <clears throat> uh, the person being arrested slipped on the ice and the two officers fell down and then a struggle ensued. Um, and one of the officers has been charged with um, uh, assault, but uh, the charges didn't come from the individual who, was, who fell it was because he was too drunk to know what was happening, but it was two other officers that were at the scene who, um, it, it's inter I mean, it's, it's interesting in this case. Um, Hello there. Hi. That was just a little. <laughs> this is when you're zooming by at home. Um, okay. Um, anyway, I, I'm comfortable leaving as is. Where's the rest of the committee? I'll I thought Will does leaving it. Too. Uh, Sorry. Thunder White. Yeah. No, I just thought uh, Wilda gave a really good, um, helped me understand that better right. and I'm okay with it. All right. All right. Um, I'm trying to go over where there were questions. Um, and one of those was um, the joke hold definition I think everybody agrees is a is a good thing the question is should they um, now we go to um, page five number five and six um, you just mentioned when when feasible arm officers shall prior to the use of force make reasonable efforts to identify him as ourselves Warn that deadly force may be used, and then a law enforcement officer shall not use a chokehold on a person unless justified deadly force is justified. Excuse me, unless deadly force is justified pursuant to sub subdivisions one through four of this section. And that's the question. So, do you on, allow it? On, if I can just start on five. Yep. I, I think here when feasible makes perfect sense because um, you can, it's, it's when feasible shall do, shall actually do these actions, identify him, himself or warn that deadly force may be used. And there might be circumstances where it can't be done. The action happens too fast and they can't issue the warning. So when feasible makes sense there. Um, so I'm fine with five. Um, and then I, I suppose if the purpose of the bill is to clarify what, um, uh, Wilda was saying is, is now contradictory in what we passed last session, this makes it clear that a law enforcement can't use it under any other circumstance but this. So I, I appreciate that the House, I don't know if you remember, but one of the early versions of, I wanna say it was um, 119, had no. permissive language where it said a chokehold may be used in this situation. I appreciate that they framed it this way a law enforcement officer shall not use a chokehold unless. Yep. Um, so that's that's better. I still don't don't actually like it, but I could I could probably live with it. Uh, 
I actually think that our house colleagues did a good job articulating this. Whoa. Okay. Please don't let anybody in the house know that that was just. <laughs> actually, I was specifically <laughs> saying that for the purpose of YouTube recording it and preserving it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Or, or maybe I should have said, I appreciate how Bryn phrased this language. It's articulated very good. And that the I would house, agree with. The house went along with it. <laughs> yes. Bryn did a great job on that section. <laughs> All right. Seems like we're making progress. There was some discussion. So people are okay with that being there. Yes. Um, and by the way, anybody who wants to jump in from who's here on the call, notice that Matt Valerio, Zana Davis, um, Wild is still here, Julio Thompson's here, uh, faculty, Malcolm Schilling is still here. Feel free to raise your hand or just pop on as we discussed in the show. Um, there was some discussion the timelines. Bryn, do you remember what that discussion was? I have it noted. Um, so the the bill is that came over from the House amended the timeline from Act 165 so that it would take uh, these standards would take effect on September 1st instead of July 1st. Yep. Um, and yep. I, I do have a question about that. Um, and I'm going back to Commissioner Sherling's testimony in appropriations. W correct me if I'm wrong, Alice, um, you might remember this. Um, we, we okayed $400,000 for additional overtime training. And, and I thought that was in either budget adjustment or 315. Um, and Commissioner Sherling's testimony was that if we gave them that money, they could train to the standard by July 1st. And, and so I'm, I'm wondering two things. First of all, if that's true, do we need to change the timeline? And if they want a later timeline, do they still need the $400,000 for overtime? I don't remember. I see that in S145, we had changed some of the sections, not not even September 1st, but to October of 2021. Yeah. That regard to, uh, well, the section, this, well, there were a couple sections that would be effective on September 1st, um, but this one, well, the bulk, the remainder of the bill would be effective October 2021. And I'd have to, I'd have to find that. I remember that discussion in October. Alice, but I don't have the note in front of me. So, Jeanette has a question. Yes. Bryn, who had a question? Oh, Jeanette. Okay. Oh, no, I didn't. Oh. have notes about the change of date. <clears throat> could you um, ask, Bryn, could you ask Commissioner Sterling to join us next week? Yeah, that's Thanks. Peggy and Bryn. That's, that's my only question on the timeline is, um, oh. Is that that money, and will it still be needed? Yeah, I'd also like to talk to Julio, um, and maybe Julio, but certainly David Schur, um, John Campbell, and um, Matt or Rebecca Turner regarding the the burglary issue and the justifiable homicide. 
right. the next time we take up that specific area. Um, <clears throat> are there other issues in the bill that we should look at next week? Could, could we just go back to the dates in section eight again? Yeah, that's why I was asking uh, for Commissioner Sherling to be here to discuss the date. Right, so the, this, the House version has definitely different dates earlier than our dates that we had decided upon. So yeah, so if we could yeah. just both of those dates review. It, Shirley is coming now. Oh, well, Jennifer Morrison is here too. Oh, Commissioner, thank you. And Jennifer, thank you. Could you discuss with us the dates? One of you, either of you. Sure, I'm, I'm gonna be more likely to be able to discuss dates than the money issue that Senator Baruth raised um, relative to appropriations, because I, I wasn't part of that. But um, uh, good morning, Senator, and thank you all for uh, the hard work that you've been doing on this. Um, we do agree with Will Dwight that this has been a great uh, compromise, a lot of work done on the House mm -hmm. side. Uh, H-145, as it came to you, is a vastly better bill with more clarity in order for us to operationalize it. Uh, which is really, at the end of the day, where the rubber meets the road, is being able to take the law and put it into practice. So we agree that H-145 is, is a vast improvement to S-119. The implementation date is currently listed in this draft of September 1st. The commissioner testified previously that we would request it be moved to October 1st. Um, again, I don't know anything about overtime money. This is simply a matter of we're being very, very mindful of the process to develop the policy. So the, the legislation, of course, is the chassis, and now we're building the car to deliver the training, right? Mm -hmm. So the policy, um, as soon as we get a good sense of where this legislation is going, maybe even by the end of today, this meeting, we'll uh, begin to produce the second draft, and then we need to post it forward-facing to and allow significant period of time for feedback on that. Um, and eventually we need to arrive at a final draft. And once that final draft is created based on all the stakeholder input and, and, and other things, uh, legal review, then we need to get with the training curriculum developers and develop a statewide training. I don't know exactly how many weeks that would take to develop the training, but then we have to figure out a way to train 1200 police officers before the implementation date. So as you can see, it's sort of trying to guesstimate working backwards how we could how we could de deliver the best possible training based on the best possible policy without racing to a, a deadline that could be just eight or 12 weeks from the time the bill is passed so that's the, that's the request from the policy development team is that the implementation date uh, be pushed october 1st and i will stop talking so the commissioner can address senator Bruce's money question commissioner good Morning. Uh, apologies for no video. I pushed the wrong button as I was getting on. So rather than uh, jump off and back on, I'm going without video. Uh, Your voice I, is re very recognizable, Commissioner. So we know it's you. Thanks. Uh, for the record, Mike Carolyn, Commissioner of Public Safety. Um, I had to jump off uh, at the tail end of uh, uh, Will DeWhite's testimony. So I'm aware there's a question, but I don't um, have the... Uh, uh, the, the full scope of the question. Senator Baruth, do you want to repeat your question? Sure. So, um, Commissioner, you will remember, I think, when you were in um, appropriations, and at that time, we weren't, 145 wasn't really on the table, although it was percolating in the House. So we were thinking about the July 1st implementation, and you asked for a, a, an appropriation of 400,000 something um, for overtime in order to allow that to occur. Um, and so I'm wondering if we push the implementation back to October as um, Jennifer Morrison was just saying she would prefer, do you still need that overtime money? I believe we will, uh, just the, 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 the pace of operations is such that uh, trying to add uh, this amount of training for this many people um, 
it, the only way we can come up with a methodology to do it is to to add hours to their schedule, which of course cascades into overtime. Um, I think the original ask was something on the order of 439,000 in uh, one time um, uh, carry forward uh, or uh, budget adjustment, excuse me, uh, mm -hmm. money um, at this stage, whether it's in budget adjustment or it is uh, in the FY22 as a one time, uh, you know, fiscally that's, uh, that's at the legislature's uh, discretion. We'll certainly try to uh, minimize the impact of overtime. And one of the things I think I testified to was that um, putting uh, language in uh, that appropriation, should it come indicating it can be used uh, only for this purpose and then any uh, residual returned to the general fund would be fine as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. That's so I guess, um, not totally, I don't think. All right. Go there's, ahead, Senator Nitka. Well, there still is the piece, um, whether it would be the 8A on the effective dates. We had, we had changed it in our bill to September 1st. Is that still in play as September 1st? The House still has no, that. No, I think our, our proposal would be to change it to October 1st as uh, Jennifer are you, are you sure? just testified. Yes, that's section, that's the little b, but I'm talking about a in section eight. There's two things there. Mm -hmm. One has to do with the repeals and the other has the remainder of the act taking effect. So I, I, I see the October 1st, that's very good, but I'm wondering what's the ruling on section A? We had changed it to September 1st. So in the house bill, it's July 1st. I think um, I, I think I can answer that. Um, yeah, please do. <laughs> so that that's really um, procedural. Uh, it it means that the effective date section takes effect on July first, um, and the repeal section takes effect on July first. If you don't repeal that um, those former standards that were passed in Act One Sixty Five, then they'll go into effect on July first. So they have to be repealed. Um, so that's that's what Section A in the effective date section is about. Why had we changed it to September 1st in our bill? We, we you changed, well, the house changed the effective date to September 1st um, for the, the use of force standards. Y yes, on B, but on A. On A, we had changed it to September 1st from July 1, and on B, we had changed it to October. But I'm so wondering- What bill are you referring to? Because I- H 145, but we had taken. We I'm sorry, we never changed the A. Section 8A was never changed in, that I'm aware of. We did. Uh, Change that one to September 1st. Oh, well, anyway, I don't think so. But anyway, we had changed that one to September 1st and the other to October. Well, I don't think we can change it because then you'd have two months of different standards. <laughs> I don't believe so, but whatever. Julio, did you want to comment? Um, well, I, I was not able to log on earlier this morning, although I did I did hear that uh, one of the witnesses talk about my prior testimony. Um, yep. uh, that was Will Dwight. She, she talked about some of what I talked about, but not, but not all of it. And, and I thought I, I would just for the record mention that um, again and, and then the committee can decide what to do with it um, if that's if if the committee would like to do yeah. that and then I'm available for questions about the justifiable homicide statute if the, okay. the committee wants to take that up today or, or at a later point it's up I think we're going to take that up next week okay when we do our final vote on the bill um, okay but you're welcome to make comments on your position on B5 I believe it would be B5 yeah, so the, I mean, the point of my testimony really was about the feasibility language, which I think was in the original draft of the bill. Um, it struck our office as reasonable as a reasonable qualification because all those all the situations that we've been describing, um, 
we've been looking at instances where we all agree that it was feasible for the officer to take the information into account. So the Chamberlain case, which is a, a, a very important case out of the Second Circuit, arising out of very tragic to remember that doctrine. And also, I believe there was questions regarding B1, perhaps adding the benefit of, without benefit of hindsight, in B1. B1 on yeah, so, page two um, was another issue that we would take up next week. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah, I wasn't okay. planning on that, but there was, were the, <clears throat> whether it was object, you know, if you read B1, that was a suggestion. Um, I don't remember whether it was Commissioner Sherling or himself. Yeah. That was Commissioner uh, Sherling's suggestion. Without benefit of hindsight. So we're going to take those up next week and hopefully uh, have you would represent the attorney general's office on the on the burglary uh you know i'll check with our criminal division chief mr chair and and okay see, see whether yeah. she's somebody who she's wants got to a better and, um, okay if we could invite uh, matt valerio or rebecca turner on that as well as um Blacko or anybody else who has comments and john campbell thank you we're going to take a seven minute break till uh, maybe it's more than seven minutes 25 minutes of 11 we can get back